turning to Ryan. Ryan, in case you hadn't noticed, we have four physicians in our Voyager group. And they are, of course, Julia Kim, who's already presented, Mampella Rampella, who has presented, Tom Powers, and Ryan Jackson. And Ryan presently is the president of the International Medical Consulting Company, and he's formerly the dean of the Caribbean Medical University. He's also been the CEO of the Wyoming Business Coalition on Health. He is on the board of directors of a couple uh, organizations, of course, USACOR being one of them, and the Brain Injury Alliance of Wyoming. But most importantly, like the firefighters and the police in 9-11, uh, when he saw the burning building, he rushed in while everybody else was rushing out. And Ryan has done this for multiple kinds of catastrophes around the world, including in 2010, of course, the horrendous earthquake followed by tremors and other things and hurricanes, coordinating aid from the United Nations and prevention education, environmental restoration, and helping community support as well as the stream of physicians that we were able to pass, pass to him who he supported and uh, took to the various places, but he has been in many catastrophes in many parts of the world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean. So let us listen to Ryan's tale of going from catastrophe to wellness. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Anitra and Ted. So. I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about myself so you guys can figure out who I am and what I am talking about. So I'm going to share my screen and you will see some of my slides. So, all right, and keep the questions for the end and we will talk about this. As many of you know, the world has been going to hell in a handbasket, and there's all kinds of craziness going on. And I'm just going to try to shed some light on how to deal with this insanity. So there's a very well-known quote from the beginning of uh, Charles Dickens' classic, uh, Tale of Two Cities. But a lot of times we stop with the first part of the first sentence. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, we were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of <laughs> comparison only. So he wrote that in 1859 about a prior period, and yet it still feels so much like today. We're living in a time of madness. We have all the information available to us and we're living in complete ignorance of it. So I'll tell you about myself. I was raised in a simple family. You know, when I was born, we were living in a trailer in a very bad trailer park. So I had two brothers and a sister. And then the girl in red is one of my cousins. And I'm the smug toddler on the far right. And uh, unfortunately, I think I still seem a little too smug. So, <laughs> and my first experience overseas after being raised by a single mother on welfare was as a missionary in Brazil. 
and a nerdy one at that. That's a buckyball that I made out of toothpicks and gumdrops. So, um, but that exposed me to what the world, real world is. I thought that as a kid raised on welfare in Wyoming, that I had it as hard as anybody could possibly have it. Then in Brazil, I was exposed to people who were living in dire poverty. And the only reason they had food on their table was because of government mandates restricting the price of bread and rice and beans and coffee. And I saw families that suffered so much. In my first month in Brazil, I met a family that had been solidly middle class in Sao Paulo. But one incident changed everything in their lives. They had a car, they had a home, but their car wasn't insured. And they were hit by a drunk driver who also wasn't insured. Destroyed their car, they couldn't afford to replace it. Their son, who was seven at the time, was severely injured and spent months in the hospital. The father stayed by his side while he was in the hospital, lost his job, they lost their house. So when I met them, they were living in a tiny one room shack with one of the filthiest toilets I've ever had to use. They didn't have electricity or running water and they were slowly trying to rebuild. And the only income coming in for that family was from buying hundred pound sacks of uh, onions and breaking them down into five pound sacks. But they were happy because they had their family. The son lived, even though he could barely walk with, even while he was holding on to a surface, he couldn't talk. But the family had their unity and they would sing together and celebrate the life that they were given. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. I love C.S. Lewis. He taught a lot about pain, even before he knew what real pain was. He suffered quite a bit in his life. But he didn't really know what loss was other than losing his mother as a child and then he finally fell in love and lost his wife as an adult. But are we going to give up on exposing ourselves and making ourselves vulnerable in order to protect ourselves? Or are we going to put ourselves out there and allow the pain to happen? So this is a dear family that I knew in Belize. They were refugees from El Salvador. They fled the violence and poverty there the father was working 16 hours a day in the orange groves for $5 American, which was more than he had been making in El Salvador. And at the time, the crime in El Salvador and the risk of kidnapping or murder was higher than in Belize. And so they fled with their little family. And I helped them to get legalized. And so they started making more money. Now, home behind them, they shared with his brother and his brother's uh, wife and children. Altogether, there were about 15 people sharing that uh, simple home. No glass in the windows, no floor other than dirt. But again, they were one of the happiest families I've ever met. It's, sorry. These little girls would carry buckets of corn on their head, barefoot, down the road to be ground into cornmeal for food. And they genuinely were as happy as they appear in the picture. Until as the mother was pregnant with their, I believe it was their eighth child, and she had had all of their previous children 
uh, delivered at home by the husband. She was in excruciating pain and they called me up after I had left the lease. And I told them to go instantly to the hospital. And they found out that her cervical cancer had spread through her body. And they told her she needed to instantly start aggressive treatment to manage that. But she wanted to give the child a chance. So she waited until about seven and a half months of pregnancy when the baby could be delivered. And then she started her aggressive chemotherapy and radiation. They had to return to El Salvador because in Belize they didn't have the treatment that she needed. That invalidated the work permit that he had. And in the end, she died. So I wrote a poem for the family while she was still suffering in the hospital. And I gave it to them after she passed away in English and Spanish. But I'll share that too, with you. I can't stand to see you like this. I can't force myself to leave. You've been with me and raised our children. Now all you know is pain. Our, da our daughters can't bear to see you. I had to make them leave. They love you so much, nearly as much as I do. What will I do without you? What will I tell our son? His mother will never hear his voice. We'll never see him walk. He'll always be there in our hearts, as you were, not as you are. We love you. We'll miss you. You were a mother and a wife, a companion and a friend. You held me up when I was lost, sacrificed everything for me. I never had anything to give you, but together we knew joy. I don't know how I could live without you. Please don't stay here just for me. So this family who never had anything, finally lost the one thing that really mattered. How is that fair? How can so many people in this world be suffering beyond what they ever should have to? The world is full of pain. So I saw pain in Central America and South America and poverty. And then in 2010, I arrived in Haiti just a couple of weeks after the terrible earthquake there. And that people who lost everything, this young man, we fitted with prosthetic limbs. He lost his legs when the national cathedral collapsed and he was just outside the wall. But can we live like this? Can we have hope in this hopeless world? Here's a quote from Viktor Frankl, who was a psychiatrist and a prisoner during World War II. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. So I arranged to have this cart for this young man and because it could handle the rough terrain a little better than the wheelchair he had. And that was while we were waiting for the prosthetic limbs to be manufactured for him. Then I helped others. This is one of the prosthetists who came down with our team. Uh, from Wyoming. This is a little girl who lost her foot around the ankle. And um, we were able to get her a new foot and ankle uh, prosthesis. And she was playing soccer within 20 minutes of receiving that. But that little girl has known more pain than most of us in her short life. And she was still so happy. And there was so much devastating loss. 
so many lives, so many homes, so many businesses. And these are people who, before the earthquake, uh, were in dire poverty. Before the earthquake in Haiti, most of the people were living on less than uh, $2 a day. It was 80% were living on less than $2 a day, and 54% were living on less than $1 a day. And then to have this happen. This was a typical day with our team of doctors out there. I saw up to 200 patients a day myself, and then the others with us, uh, so many more. This was in a village where they had never seen an American, and so they had me uh, stand there, and the children lined up so they could touch me, and they wanted to touch my hair, so I had to bend down so they could touch my hair, because they'd never seen anything like it. And this was a school that we helped arrange for military tents to be able to hold the school. They were able to save some of the chairs and desks. This is a 30 kilo box of rice that we got uh, through my negotiations with the Brazilian military who were in charge of the UN peacekeepers in Haiti. They uh, were able to give it to us directly instead of through the corrupt system there where the Ministry of Health was asking for up to $1,500 a week for just one small clinic to provide the things that were given for free by the United Nations. So, so much loss. This was the National Cathedral of which they were so proud. There's the Brazilian colonel that I was able to connect with delivering you know, that's millions of dollars worth of medications and supplies. So to lighten the mood a bit, this is a comic from today. I thought it was relevant. Defining the past, present, and future. The past, the period of time that has already happened. The future, the period of time that has not yet happened. And the present, the time, period of time that I regret what has happened and dread what has not yet happened. I don't know whether to fail him or cry. I always choose crying. Too often, as we see these devastating things in the media, it overwhelms us, and we don't know what to do. We don't know how to handle this. And how can we find a way through this? We find hope. But there is still hope, and we can still keep trying. Oh, um, sorry, somebody is playing music. Um, okay, and all right, so I will go back to this and. So this is in Guatemala. So for seven years, I would take a group of doctors and nurses to Guatemala and we would help uh, the people there. They were lined up to uh, be able to be seen by us. And there's a little tent for the triage and they would get their vital signs taken and determine which one of the physicians or nurses they should see. And we also had a Guatemalan dentist who would help with us. And she did so many extractions every day. There were some terrible teeth. But with COVID, I was unable to return there. This is a kid who was tongue-tied, which usually in developed countries uh, would be something that would have been dealt with in the first year of life because it affects their speech as well as their, their sucking. It's hard for a baby to, to feed on the breast or the bottle when they have this. They're not able to uh, latch on as well. And this was a five or six year old uh, boy who had this and we were able to uh, help him uh, receive the, the simple procedure for that. 
and the little girl who came in for a checkup. This is a man who was 65 years old, had never had a pair, pair of shoes in his life, and he was still working hard every day. A lot of his work was in the river. Um, he'd have to carry things across the rivers or um, do some construction work near the rivers. And walking back and forth across the river so long, his feet were starting to uh, hurt him. So I couldn't fit him into a regular pair of shoes because his feet were so swollen and so broad and calloused from 65 years of being barefoot. But I was able to finally find him a used pair of shoes specifically made to walk in the water. So some people use them for beaches and they were elastic enough that they could fit him. And then I had to pay another quarter for a spare pair of shoelaces. So altogether, I put in about a dollar twenty-five, and this man got the first pair of shoes he had ever worn. And we took them on a trial run, and he was able to uh, see that they would work. So, are we tilting at windmills, trying to make this world a more hopeful place? Are we wasting our time? I really love the work of Cervantes. You know, many people have heard of Man of La Mancha and things like that. I loved reading the original in Spanish. But this one quote, which is part of the musical, is one man scorned and covered with scars still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable stars and the world will be better for this. He was a madman trying to fight for a better world. I strongly believe that whatever we can do in this world, whatever love we show, whatever compassion we have, whatever little help we give is going to make a difference. Will help restore hope to the hopeless and help them see that they are humans. One of the most terrible things that I've seen, which is an old tactic, is the dehumanization of people who are different or who disagree with us regardless of political party or nation or race or whatever differences we have, dehumanizing those who are different from us is one of the most devastating things that we can do. And when you see this as it's been systemized in so many places where it's such a part of the social uh, function that the, the people start believing it. They start believing that they are not truly human, that they are somehow less than the others. And as we show kindness to these people, as we remind them that they are human, that they deserve to live and they deserve to have joy in this life, that can help restore their hope, even in a hopeless situation. We may not be able to help all of them. As a couple of weeks ago, I was in California helping with two wonderful organizations which have evacuated a great number, number of women and children and their families from Afghanistan. Some of those women were so hopeless and hurting so much because they couldn't do more. They couldn't save all of them. And I tried to help them see that even though they couldn't save all of them, that they had done such a great amount of good. They had helped so many 
and even the ones they weren't able to rescue physically, they were able to free their minds by having them see that women can be so much more than property. They can see that women are human and that they deserve to be treated as humans. And that is a lasting good that can never be taken away. This was in Puerto Rico uh, three years ago. This was my last, or no, two years ago, my last trip before uh, COVID shut down so much of the travel. We had a lot of earthquakes and while I was there, they kept having more earthquakes. And the people were so scared. You know, these strong men who have handled terrible hurricanes every year, they were terrified by earthquakes because they didn't know how to predict them, how to prepare for them. So I had to help them see that they can get through this, that they can know how to protect their families. And, you know, the same emergency gear that they have for the hurricanes, they can leave that by the door and when things start shaking, they can grab that and go. And just these little things helped them restore their hope that they wouldn't be destroyed. And it helped them see that someone cared enough to listen to them and to talk to them and comfort them. So even though I couldn't rebuild their homes, I did connect them with organizations that did have the means to do that and had food and water for them. But I was there to listen and offer little support. And I wanted to do so much more in each of these countries. I wanted to do so much more but I had my limitations. This was a wonderful couple. They were the happiest ones I met in Puerto Rico because they couldn't remember. The husband every 30 seconds would tell me about his service in World War II, of which he was very proud. And then his wife would cut him off every 30 seconds and tell me that she had never been through an earthquake. And uh, they just kept repeating the same thing, but they were happy. In their case, they were happy, partly because of their ignorance and partly because they still had each other. But having that family connection was so important to them. And then again, knowing that someone came to check on them and to show them that they mattered that they weren't forgotten amid so many that needed help. And a few months after that, they had the, last year there was a volcanic eruption in St. Vincent. And I couldn't travel there because they had a quarantine for COVID at the time. I worked with my church to help get desperately needed food and water there. And then I was supervising a team of counselors remotely over Zoom and following up with them over WhatsApp and things like that, making sure that they had the things they needed. And so much of it was just listening to them, helping them know that this wasn't the end of the world, they would be able to go back to their homes eventually, that their lives would be able to get back to normal. Even if it wasn't living in the lap of luxury, they would be able to be restored to peace. Part of the problem from that volcano was that the lava blocked the river that provided most of their drinking water. So the left picture is before the volcano and the right picture is after the volcano. You see the flow has significantly decreased and 
was not able to be processed in their existing water treatment plants. So a lot of what I was having to help with was making sure that the water shipments were coming in. Because a lot of times people don't think of how much water people need to get through a day. This is part of the lava flow. That's the edge of the river. Used to be about uh, six meters deep of water. Now it's lava. And since then, they've been able to restore the flow. But there were several months in which the people were terrified that they wouldn't have enough water to survive. And about a third of the population of St. Vincent had to evacuate from their homes. Most of them have been able to return since then. But the fear and the desperation that they were feeling, that was what we needed to help with. We helped them with the food and water and we had shelters. Many of them were sheltered in schools or churches, but we got the counselors out to them. They were going to these little areas where they were sheltered. There was one church where there were about 50 people uh, sheltered in one church. And we had the counselors meet with the families and with the individuals and help them work through the fear that they were experiencing. Some of it was as simple as just psychological first aid. And so I trained these counselors on how to do that rather than a full therapy session because we just didn't have enough counselors to go around to do full therapies for everyone. But first I sent them through doing the first aid and then flagging the people who needed more intensive therapy. And then we were able to do the therapy and then there were a few that they were able to identify who had existing um, psychological uh, disorders and psychiatric disorders. And we were able to uh, connect them with the medications that sometimes they weren't able to access because they had to evacuate. But most of what we were doing is trying to help these people feel safe and that someone cared about them. And then while they had water shortages, the floods came. And they didn't have the resources to collect the rainwater, but it was enough to destroy a lot of the infrastructure. So not the water they needed to save their lives, but enough to make things a lot more difficult. So, but as I've worked with these people, I've tried to help them see that when they have a reason, they can get through anything. Victor Frankl, again, he shared this, where those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. And I had seen that firsthand. Back in 2010, a woman was brought to me who had attempted suicide. And that woman, when she was explaining through her tears why she couldn't stand to live in this world any longer, I just wept with her because on the day of the earthquake, she had been celebrating because her three children and her five grandchildren came for a visit. And while she was preparing a snack for them in the kitchen, her family was three meters away, about 10 feet away in the other room and the house collapsed on them. Wiped out her entire posterity in one shot and destroyed all of her worldly possessions. She literally lost everything. And when I heard that, I told him that I couldn't possibly understand the pain she was feeling. 
and that I prayed to God to never understand that pain. But I said that through that pain, she could understand the many people in Haiti who had lost their loved ones more than I ever could. So I asked her to use that pain to help the widows and orphans in a way that I couldn't. So I connected her with organizations that were focused on the widows and orphans. And I kept following up with her to see how she was doing. And after a few months, I saw a miracle in that woman's life because I saw that woman smile as she was surrounded by little children again. And she had found her purpose. She felt like she had a reason to keep living. It didn't bring back her material possessions. It didn't put her in a country that was safer or wealthier. But she found purpose. And she was able to use the great love she had which was the reason that she was hurting so deeply for the loss of her family. She was use, able to use that love to help others. And that will always be with me. And that is why I keep trying. That and many other experiences like that keep me going in a world that seems pointless. So I invite each of you to not give up. No matter how terrible this world gets, we're seeing war, we're seeing poverty, we're seeing completely unfair things in this world. But we can still stand as examples and restore hope to those we can. That's my invitation. Well, that Ryan, thank you for such a powerful narrative in defiance of catastrophe, complete defiance of, of catastrophe and passivity. And uh, I'm sure that our, our voyagers have questions, but one of mine is, how how did you get the people to accept you and your fellow uh, medical and uh, other helpers to to allow them to to be helped? It seems to me that they were all very independent kind of people, and that the initial interaction had had to be quite intuitive on your part to get into their hearts so that you could help them medically and with other help. Mm -hmm. and that, there's no one size fits all kind of thing for that. But sincerity is one of the key things. People, no matter where they are or what they're going through, they can tell if you genuinely care and if you're there to help them or just to uh, do a photo shoot. There's a lot of people just go to these devastated areas and uh, take some pictures and then get the hell out. Tourism. Yeah. <laughs> and um, when they see that you're willing to sit down with them and you know, just listen. And yeah, right. I, I, Ryan, uh, a lot of the work we do with small communities, uh, often not in, in distress to the same extent, but being impacted by, by uh, other people coming in or new developments or things wanting to take their land away and so on. Uh, I, I, what I heard from you was essentially just listen. And we've discovered the same thing, 
there's so many people coming in and trying to tell them what to do rather than ask them. Uh, so if there was one uh, conclusion was to ask them what they really want or need, ask them, don't tell them. Well, and, and so often uh, when we look at uh, the things going on in these countries and the living conditions, yeah. we think that we're supposed to bring them up to what we're used to. That's not going to make them happy. And I learned that uh, with this family in Belize. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my mother, when I told her about this family, she said, oh, well, you need to get them electricity and you need them to have a television so their children can learn from Sesame Street and things like that. And I said, well, besides Sesame Street, they would also see the extreme wealth on all these television shows. And then you would just expose them to how poor they really are because they can't really understand how poor they are at the moment. You're going to show them that they are miserable. And uh, we need to help them live the way they're used to living. Maybe improve that if it's not safe or it's not healthy, but there's no reason for them to try to live like Americans or Europeans. And, and, and they wouldn't be happier, I promise you. <laughs> so. And I, I want to say from my experience of working with you, Ryan, um, I was very surprised when we were in, at our meeting after the um, for the Afghan team from Warrior Angel Rescue and Vita School. And um, they Ryan just created a space. And so our the people who came in I had like immediate safety to express themselves and the things that came out were very powerful. Um, everybody gave in ways that you wouldn't normally see. And there was a level of intimacy and the willingness to share um, that was really, really touching. We had one person who had just been evacuated from Afghanistan who was running our school. And um, it, it was very, I never, she, I'd never seen her be able to talk about that experience. So I want to thank you for doing that. Well, war, of course, <laughs> being another <laughs> catastrophe. <laughs> so, but um, it's just experience. Mm -hmm. I've spent my career helping the desperate rather than focusing on uh, getting wealthy. And so I've been dealing with people in their own languages. I've had to learn several languages over the years and just be willing to get dirty and listen. And in California with these wonderful women there, I, I felt good because, you know, sometimes in a group of all women, when <laughs> there's one guy there, they don't feel as uh, comfortable uh, opening up and talking about those things. But I was able to help them see that I'm not the threat and that I just want to help them find the healing that's inside them. And we don't have magic solutions for the terrible things in the world, but we can help people feel safer and we can help them feel loved. And that's what I try to get out there. And that's, I hope the women in California <laughs> were able to feel that. It sounds like Marilyn felt some of that, but we're living in a world of so much selfishness so much greed, so much bitterness, and so much of it just leads to this desperate underlying fear in so many people. And we have to get through that fear. We have to help them feel safe again. And It's <laughs> Ryan, I think you're the antidote to antidote to avarice, really. And, and we, we gotta patent you, but then that would make money. <laughs> but I much much appreciate your, your comment. David, David Pollock, did you want to make a comment? Well, it was really just a question to Ryan about when your life is undoubtedly filled with so much sense of purpose and meaning. Why do you think that not more people follow your kind of path? Well, what, what what really obstructs 
people in European, North American cultures uh, from ultimately finding their way toward higher meaning because you're in a minority in terms of the way people pursue their, their path. Dr. Jackson, this is Deb. I'd be happy to say, I think it's because we're too afraid. Yeah. We have gotten used to a system where status and money matter more than anything. And I run into this a lot. I, I had to uh, dissolve a, a nonprofit last year. And I've been since trying to find another nonprofit to run. And uh, it's just so frustrating because people see my resume and they just don't believe it because you know they think, well, this doesn't make sense that a person like this is focused on helping people rather than getting rich and getting a reputation. And why haven't we seen him on a TED talk yet? And, you know, it's people are so desperate to be acknowledged and to get fame and fortune. And I think it's always been that way. And uh, there's a book, a series of books uh, called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I don't remember the exact quote, but there was a part of that where they were talking about how uh, they were looking at it from an alien's perspective that, uh, you know, Earthlings uh, focus their lives on exchanging little green pieces of money, but it doesn't seem to help them much because it's not the green pieces of paper that are unhappy. <laughs> so, but, but I mean, just to, just to push it a, a little further, the question then is, what are the factors that press us uh, toward the desire for dollars and status? And then what are the countervailing factors that cause some people to say, no, there's more than that? Are there things in our educational system, in our laws for advertising? Are there family conversations? I. Um, I mean, some of the factors that sort of you think can yeah. push people in one direction rather than the other. I think a major factor is debt. In the debt? United States, debt. D -E -B -T. Debt, not death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although death can lead to debt and vice versa. <laughs> um, so you so many people in the United States get into debt to get their education, to get their home, to get their car, and then to get all the cool things that they're told they need because we're living in a growth economy that um, the whole pyramid scheme is dependent on people buying more and more and more so that we can pay the people who previously bought more and more and more. <laughs> and as we live with the debt, that creates this sense of fear and desperation. And it drives so much of what we do in our lives. So many doctors who went to medical school hoping to be like their heroes uh, of old who would go off to the jungles and uh, work for free. By the time they graduate with over $300,000 in debt, they realize that's not an option. And as they continue to pay off that debt and then they rack up more debt as they buy a home and have children and all of these things they never get around to the altruism that drove them into medicine in the first place were you able to avoid debt on your educational journey oh no i i'm from a poor white trash family so uh, that's what you know, i thought you by said. a single mom on welfare i had a huge amount of debt um but over the years, um, I was able to settle down for a bit in Curacao and still uh, do some of these trips on the side. But while I was in Curacao, I was able to uh, get rid of most of my debt. So I'm in a spot where the desperation has eased slightly, but um, I have been through a couple of divorces and uh, so that I haven't been completely free of the consequences of uh, 
debt and uh, those things. Brian, so, uh, Brian, is it therefore a question of our inherent and intrinsic values, or do we have we fostered a, a system that drives us into very particular grooves, virtually programs us to value very specific things? Uh, such as money, or as, as, they, as they said in the Hitchhiker's Guide, the answer is 42. But, <laughs> well, but are we, in fact, programmed by our system to choose values that don't relate to true success for humanity and its planet? I, the system is flawed. Yeah. And... I, I don't have a solution because it's not, mm -hmm. if you did, it's not I'd just the you. capitalism. Uh, the <laughs> yeah. socialist countries are, are affected, the communist countries. Yeah. I, I don't see uh, an anarchist system working mm -hmm. any better. So yeah. <laughs> I, I think it comes down to the very basic thing. Mm -hmm. Do we care about other people? Mm -hmm. yeah. And if we care about other people, then we can do a little bit each day to help. I'm not telling people to just sell everything they own and live like a hermit, but we can do a little bit of good each day. If we see someone starving and filthy and hungry, if we just show some compassion and treat them like a human being, that does some good. I had a woman in Washington, D.C. who came up to me to sell one of the newspapers they publish uh, for the homeless to help them write down some of their own articles and make some money selling them. And I asked her if she had eaten. And she didn't realize that anybody actually cared. So I, I fed her rather than just buying the newspaper for a dollar. And she just cried because I think it had been a while since anyone outside of her inner circle had treated her as a human being. So that's, and that was so little of my time, so little of what I had, but I, I think that's all we need. Brian, this is a, wonder, a wonderful exploration of values, uh, and you're, you're really forcing us to think of a much broader range of values. And I think each of the rest of us may have something to contribute. Uh, I, I'm trying to aim you guys at the end of this thing to talk about how we, uh, how we therefore contribute more to well-being. Uh, to the whole concept and, and really what we want to do next uh, based on these wonderful experiences and, and concepts and approaches that each of our people have been bringing forward, showing that it is possible to have a totally different value set and it may even be possible to communicate it. Yeah. I'd like to um, interject a little bit. If yes, I might. yes, Van, <clears throat> go ahead. Uh, Ryan, I was very inspirational. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, empathy and compassion are things that if you, if you bring to a situation and to people are sort of immediately felt. They don't just require, <clears throat> uh, they aren't um, communicated with words. They're communicated by people feeling our feelings our care and by what we actually do. And, and I just, I found, again, it was a very inspirational uh, presentation and thank you for all you've done. Thank you. 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 Thank you.